Hi, I'm Mark Walls. And I'm Kimberly George. Welcome to our Out Front Ideas with Kimberly and Mark. Today we're at RIMS 2015 down in New Orleans, and we've got a great topic today. And we're live throughout this, <laughs> this series. Yes, it's live TV. <laughs> <laughs> it's live. Um, we are going to be talking today about workers' compensation and the evolution of claims models. We'd like to start by thanking our sponsors, Safety National and Sedgwick, for making this all possible. And to Mr. Jonathan Mast, our man on the camera today. Thanks, Jonathan. We are coming to you live from the beautiful Versailles Ballroom at the La Pavilion Hotel. And our first guest today is the lady in this picture above me. This place has kind of an Adams Family vibe to it, and so kind of freaking me out a little bit. Okay, anyway, our topic today is actually on the evolution of the workers' compensation industry, and we've got a variety of guests joining us. First up, we have Pamela Ferrandino, Executive Vice President from Willis, the Casualty Practice. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Thanks for having me. So, Pam, some have suggested that workers' compensation reforms in states have swung the pendulum too far away from injured workers. Do you feel the workers' compensation system and laws have become too conservative? I wouldn't say that at all. In fact, I think that there's probably still more reform that can come. And as we're starting to see some of the improvements in California that are just uh, minimal so far in, in terms of some of the uh, medical trends, I don't think it's really gone far enough. I think what the employers really are looking for more latitude so that they can do the best thing for their employees to get their employees back to work. So when we look at the changes that put more control in the hands of the employer with their partners, I think that's where we usually get the best outcome. So I would say to this point, no. Great. Mark, how do you feel about that question? You know, I, I think a lot of the reforms you've seen the last few years have been really to balance the scale more toward the middle. Workers' compensation had really tipped away from the employer to uh, the point where it had expanded what was being covered under workers' compensation well beyond what was the original intent of the workers' compensation statutes. And so I think a lot of the reforms you've seen the last few years where it tightened thresholds of compensability um, was trying to really recenter things. So oh, I don't think it's gotten too conservative. I think the, the goal of the reforms the last few years has been to get it back to where it belongs. So you wrote a blog recently on caring that takes place in workers' compensation, and we don't talk enough about that. Would you just hit a little bit on your response to some of the media? Sure, sure, Kimberly. You know, there's, there's always criticism. No matter what you do, there's always criticisms of, of, of the industry. And the point of my blog posting was the fact that this industry does a lot of really good things. You know, we are an industry that cares for people. We help people. That's what we do each and every day is we help people. And the vast majority of claims that go through the workers' compensation system, the system works exactly as it was set out to do. Uh, the injured worker receives the appropriate medical care. They are compensated for their time away from work. It, it functions exactly as it was set up to do. And I think as an industry, we need to do a better job talking about the good things that we do each and every day. I mean, we are in the business of helping people. And I just don't think we give that enough attention on a daily basis. Great. Thanks for sharing that. So Texas and Oklahoma allow employers to opt out of workers' compensation. And there's certainly a movement at this point and a lot of discussion in other states to allow an opt-out type program. How do you feel about opt-out? Pamela? I think the opt-out is actually it seems to be working very well for certain industries. We've, we've seen it be very successful in Texas over the past few years and while it's still relatively new in the state of Oklahoma, it still is meant to provide a, at least a minimum um, that is of care that is equal to or better than what um, would be received under the workers' compensation um, or under traditional workers' compensation. But what we hear employers doing in um, Oklahoma is really trying to provide better care and taking the ability, their ability under the opt-out provisions to work with their partners to be able to provide a better standard of care, um, better treatment, better guidelines. And um, most employers really are looking as their employees are an important and critical asset to their organization. And so they do want to get them healthy. They want to get them returned to work as soon as possible, and they want to provide them a better level of care. And I think in those states um, where they have the opt-out capabilities, that's been the intent, and that's what mm -hmm. they're achieving. 
And do you believe it will be successful, the expansion of opt-out? I think it will be. I think there's still probably some ebbs and flows or corrections that are going to have to occur. We've seen some um, law, some ramifications in Oklahoma uh, with some test cases coming out of it, which I know we're going to talk about a little bit later. But I think overall it will be successful because the intent behind it is to provide a better level of care. And Mark, you have a good pulse on the industry and your work comp analysis group. Do you see opt-out as an initiative that will move forward? You know, it, it's interesting to see how this is playing out because you know, the, the Texas opt-out system is very different than other states in that the employers that opt out in Texas don't have to provide an alternative benefit plan. Many large employers do, but they're not required to. Opt-out in Oklahoma required em employers to provide the same or greater benefits than under the workers' compensation system. So it is a true alternative to mm -hmm. traditional workers' compensation. And to achieve the savings in Oklahoma, what an employer needs to focus on is providing the best possible medical treatment for their injured workers. You know, the theory is if you get the person the best medical treatment, you get the best medical outcomes, you're going to achieve cost savings. I think that model is very exportable to other states. Now, there's, there's a lot of effort going on right now to look at other states and pushing opt-out to other states. And there was a bill in Tennessee that, that you know, this year, I think there was a lot of people thought that was going to go through because there had been discussions on that last year, and that ended up dying in committee. Mm -hmm. And you saw some pushback on that bill. And I, I think a part of that pushback was because that that bill in Tennessee was kind of a hybrid between the Texas and the Oklahoma models in that it had, uh, it required a minimum threshold of benefits, but it didn't require the same benefits as under the workers' compensation system. And I think some people found that um, a little too tipped in the other direction. And so we'll, we'll see where this goes forward. I expect to see more, if this is going to expand more, I think it'll follow the Oklahoma model more where you're providing the same or similar benefits, but the employer has you know, the medical control that can get that injured worker timely treatment with the best medical providers, and hopefully you can get out of the bureaucracy of workers' compensation and speed the adjudication along. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're going to shift now. Back to you, Pam. Some are calling for the federal government to become more involved with workers' compensation and impose minimum standards. Do you feel that federal involvement with workers' compensation would be a benefit? No. Um, actually, I, I think as we look at most programs, I don't think uh, federalizing something that really is at a state-specific level and should remain at a state-specific level will have a um, favorable outcome. I don't think we've ever seen anything that when it's nationalized has it's had a better outcome. I think also when we look at the employment bases in um, various states and we look at even the benefit levels, state by state they vary. If we look at the nature of employment, that may be up in the New England states where you might have um, high tech, you may have um, maritime, you may have other things that as the workers' comp law has evolved, you can, you can almost understand why there is a, such a variation, even if you want to be as a you know, bespoke as to look at the value of an, uh, a digit. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Over, so one may be worth a lot more in one state or a lot less in the other, but it's really the nature of the employment and the, uh, the work that exists in those states. And I think if you put everything at a national level, we'd probably end up looking at a country that looked like California from a comp perspective. And I don't think that the states that have a uh, benefit level that's higher than national would be willing to give that up, so we'd probably go, be going to probably the most inefficient platform, and I think that would do nothing really for employees or employers at that level. Mm -hmm. Well, Pam, along those lines, think about the federal workers' compensation programs that already exist, USL&H, uh, yeah, the Railroad Workers yeah. Act. You know, what I hear about those, high cost, a lot of inefficiency. I mean. Is that your experience with those programs as well? Yeah, and I think that it's, again, it's uh, taking that sort of approach is not necessarily going <coughs> to uh, be beneficial for the employees in terms of getting them back to work because often when we look at FELA, uh, where, what is uh, the baseline for negligence or what is the baseline for a claim may be very different than what we mm -hmm. might look at it, even at workers' compensation at a state-specific level. Is there any thought around maybe the difference between the um, indemnity portion if the federal government were to step in and medical? 
I haven't heard much of discussion around medical care if it were to be federalized. Has that been a discussion at all? Everything that I've heard around it is focusing more on the indemnity benefit levels, and it's really focused more, as, as you pointed out, uh, what's the value for permanent impairment? Of, right. uh, that's something that people really locked in mm -hmm. on was that the, that the value for an amputation in one state versus another state is, is significantly different. But I think you, you lose sight of the fact, and, and Pam cited this, you know, these states are different by design. They've done things differently. You know, there, are, there are some states out there that don't focus on, on permanent disability at all. They focus on return to work. Mm -hmm. you know, Pennsylvania and Michigan, they're wage loss states. Right. If you go back to work at your regular wage, that the, the system has done what it was intended to do. That's the end of yeah. the claim. Whereas other states focus on this, you know, kind of a tort element of workers' comp of providing a settlement at the end of the claim, even if you do go back to work. So you know, everything's different by design. But. I think there's some other states, if we look at states like New York, where um, I think that uh, labor law, I still view labor law as one of the unintended consequences of the worker inefficiency of the workers' comp system because of uh, whether it's been second injury fund or whether it's been some of the other assessments or um, just the inefficiency within the overall workers' comp system in that state uh, have put the assessments at such a high threshold. There's no basis that even lets them um, bring up the, the wage level or the indemnity mm -hmm. piece to anything close to a living wage. And so obviously somebody who's working in New York City in construction when they're injured, um, it doesn't provide them with a living wage. And I think that some of the issues that we see around some of the other costs, such as labor law, can't get reconciled until the comp piece of it is resolved. Great discussion. Okay, Mark, let's move on to Florida and the Paget litigation. It involved a judge declaring that workers' compensation was unconstitutional because it no longer represented a, a grand bargain for injured workers. Do you anticipate seeing similar litigation in other states? You know, as, as long as workers' compensation's been around, there's always been litigation around exclusive remedy and the plaintiff's bar trying to punch holes in the exclusive remedy of workers' compensation so that they could pursue these cases in civil court. In Paget, they got creative and focused on constitutionality issues. And, and really, if you look at the Paget case, it was a very hand-picked case. You know, they found a, a court in Dade County that would issue a, a ruling on the merits of the workers' compensation uh, statutes, but they didn't involve the state attorney general's office in the case. They never mm -hmm. motioned them into the case. And so people look at that and, and they wonder why the AG's office didn't defend it. They didn't know about it. They found out about it after the fact when the rest of us did. And so, you know, Paget was a different animal. But the issues in Paget go to some of the issues we were talking about at the start of this conversation in, in that over time uh, you've seen several states who have tightened their thresholds of, of comp what makes a compensable claim. You've seen states that have adjusted their benefit levels. And the judge at Paget looked at that and said the changes that have been made in the Florida workers' compensation statutes over the last 10 years have tipped the balance away from the injured worker to the employer to the point where this no longer constitutes that grand bargain that is workers' compensation. So because of that, the judge in Paget ruled that workers, the Florida statute was unconstitutional on its face. Now, could we see this litigation in other states? Yeah, you could. You could yeah. see this litigation in any state that's had similar reforms in the last few years. As a matter of fact, last month, I testified at a Senate hearing in the state of Kansas where they had introduced a bill to roll back a portion of their workers' compensation reforms specifically because they were afraid of pageant style litigation in their states. So we could see this in other states. And, you know, Pam, I, I want to turn to you on this because to me this gets tricky on the coverage side. Mm -hmm. When we start talking about um, this litigation around, you know, if somebody gets drug into courts litigating on is workers' comp constitutional on their claim, uh, How's coverage going to respond to that? Well, I'll, I'll say, well, I'm not an attorney. I'll play one on TV <laughs> today, right? Right. <laughs> but um, I think it's really it's going to be it's going to be state by state because, as we've talked about, really it's the individual, the acts in a given state that are giving um, rise. If we were talking about Missouri uh, earlier, uh, before we went on camera, and we're thinking about it, 
Missouri as a state looks at what is an accident. And, you know, so it's a workplace accident. It's not necessarily an injury that occurs within the scope of employment. It's an, it's an accident such as a slip and fall. And I think that you can't necessarily look at the Paget case and apply it specifically to another state. I think what we do see is people um, or attorneys, maybe we can look at it, that are trying to test some of the provisions within an individual state to try and um, erode workers' comp as an exclusive remedy um, to try and bring in a tort uh, basis as well. Well, and, and Kimberly, there's litigation in Oklahoma right now over their workers' compensation statute. And the, the focus of that was the statutory language around uh, work injuries being foreseeable or not. Yeah. And you know, the intention of that statute was, was really to try to limit that creep of uh, degenerative conditions, pre-existing conditions into workers' compensation, and they managed to find a judge that looked at that and said, well, if an injury is foreseeable, then but, it's not covered under comp. But that, again, comp. was a hand-picked case. It was yeah, very so much a hand-picked case. Most injured workers who um, aren't going to say, I'm not going to uh, choose to pursue coverage under workers' comp. I'm going to wait to bring this to trial. There was not a claim in that case. Right. That one went right to litigation to try and create a foundation for a claim. And most injured workers are not going to say, let me wait until I can get a hearing. Yeah, wait mm -hmm. two years in a, in a right. tort system. Um, yeah, no question. But, you know, what my concern around that, that, Pam, with the Oklahoma case is what happened in Missouri a few years ago with occupational disease. Mm -hmm. Missouri did some workers' compensation reforms. The plaintiff's bar picked up on something in the language and, and through the course of litigation managed to get occupational disease removed from the workers' compensation statutes in the state of Missouri. And then you had a big mess legislatively trying to get that out. And really, from, from a coverage standpoint as well. You know, there weren't a lot of cases that went through the courts in that. Mm -hmm. People were quick to settle them out. But I knew I heard a lot of questions around where's coverage for this going to fall? Is this going to fall under Part B or not? Yeah, and I, I think it gets tricky. I'm going to jump back actually to that Oklahoma case because when we looked at Oklahoma, that's a state where they use a, they had the wording in foreseeable. And then that's also a state where they have an NCCI endorsement that talks about intentional and the way that mm -hmm. is injured or worded there's some overlap in what is foreseeable versus what is intentional. Um, and there was a little ambiguity. And as we spoke with some outside attorneys in that space, they said the intent is not for that endorsement to cover, uh, to exclude foreseeable, but it's just, there. it's unclear and it's my understanding that NCCI is actually gonna go back and modify that endorsement for coverage because it is, um, it, it just kind of compounds the issue in the state. Time, rather than just sitting back and relying on papers and process, you've really engaged and, and given your team the authority and expectation to get involved. And it's communicating with the employee, right? I mean, we have all these state mandated forms, right? You can imagine you get this thick pack of forms when you've had a work comp injury and you read through it, just glaze over, right? It, they're confusing, right? Yeah. So, so it's, it's that ability to communicate with the employee and again, everyone being on the same team and saying the same thing, right? Versus the claims adjuster saying one thing, the doctor saying another, right? Everyone, again, is communicating correctly and the same message that, hey, we want to get you well and we want to get you back to work as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's key. Yeah, you know, I wanted to follow up on something you mentioned earlier and that was how you were investing in your claims handling program with lower case loads. I, I think a, a mistake many employers make is looking at their workers' compensation program as a, as a cost and not a potential cost savings. And they make decisions based on looking at something on the spreadsheet and going with the lowest price. Mm -hmm. Can you go into some additional details of, uh, about why you've done the things you've done around that and, and how that investment has paid off in your program? You know, Mark, I've talked to many risk managers who, you know, at the end of the day is they're going to save some money through cutting an administrative expense, whether it's their, their TPA or their insurance company or whatever it might be. And, and in my opinion, that's, that, that's a penny wise and a pound foolish, right? We have a uh, constant... Uh, analysis and discussions with our actuary about this exact topic, right, of making the investment of keeping caseloads down, of being able to be proactive, right, to be able to communicate properly, right, and what that ultimately with that right. 
next level if they need to treat outside? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a partnership. Edgewick Adjuster realize that, you know, they're the gatekeeper. They're the coach kind of coaching everyone, right? But they understand the whole program. And they know they have all these. Rather than just sitting back and relying on papers and process, you've right. really engaged and, and given your team the authority and expectation to get involved. And it's communicating with the employee. Right? I mean, we have all these state-mandated forms, right? You can imagine you get this thick pack of forms when you've had a work comp injury and you read through it, whew, just glaze over, right? They're, it, they're confusing, right? Yeah. So, so it's, it's that ability to communicate with the employee and, again, everyone being on the same team and saying the same thing, right, versus the claims adjuster saying one thing, the doctor saying another, right? Everyone, again, is communicating correctly and the same message that, hey, we want to get you well and we want to get you back to work as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's key. Yeah, you know, I wanted to follow up on something you mentioned earlier, and that was how you were investing in your claims handling program with lower caseloads. I, I think a, a mistake many employers make is looking at their workers' compensation program as a, as a cost and not mm -hmm. a potential cost savings, and they make decisions based on looking at something on the spreadsheet and going with the lowest price. Can you go into some additional details about why you've done the things you've done around that and, and how that investment has paid off in your program? You know, Mark, I've talked to many risk managers who, you know, at the end of the day, is they're going to save some money through cutting an administrative expense, whether it's their, their TPA or their insurance company or whatever it might be. And, and in my opinion, that's, that, that's a penny wise and a pound foolish, right? We have a constant uh, analysis and discussions with our actuary about this exact topic right, of making the investment, of keeping caseloads down, of being able to be proactive, right, to be able to communicate properly. And your employees are customers essentially as well in the claims process. And I don't know that we always thought about that in the past um, as much as we hear about it now. What's to you now, Julie? You know, Coles is known for their great customer service. So how are you taking this customer service model to focus on the customer and bringing that to your workers' compensation program? So I think some of it translates to a good customer experience, has the right product at the right time, but can enhance that with personal connections. And ensuring that you have that personal connection, I believe, can really help the claims process for the outcome of the injured associate as well as the outcome for Kohl's. Some of the ways that we do that and have built a program around those fundamentals um, it starts really when the claim gets reported and how the manager responds to that associate. And how effective they are, I think, relies on, number one, how they are personally, but also how the program is structured. So we utilize allocation methods to ensure that the manager knows his job is to first take that report of injury, care for that associate, ensure that they can get the right treatment, and then also turn them over to a work comp professional as quickly as possible. From there, we work with our adjusters and our nurses. We're a big um, proponent and channel our associates into the outcome-based networks. We're strong believers, as Kevin mentioned, in not really worrying about the expense. We want a sports medicine approach, but it's all about the return on investment. If we can get the associate the right treatment um, and quickly and then get them back to work, we feel that they can get um, a better outcome for their injury, um, return to whole that much quicker, and as a result, it also helps uh, with overall costs. Some of the other things that we're doing is really focusing on the wellness of an associate. If you think about the work comp process in and of itself, it's complicated sometimes for all of us, and we're experts in it, let alone for an individual who really has no experience. And unless they feel embraced and educated and understand the expectations, they may actually feel that they need to seek counsel outside of the adjuster and the nurse in our risk management program. So we do our best to communicate and have open and honest communication with our associates and we think that also contributes to a positive, not only ongoing relationship with that associate, but also outcome in the claim. We're also talking to them about wellness issues, um, our nurses and our adjusters, helping us to have conversations with them about their personal unique needs, um, whether it's their living styles or habits, 
they, and if they're going to go in for surgery, they maybe need to understand a little bit more about that treatment or a little bit more about how some of their maybe another uh, personal illness or something like that can contribute or what they may need to do to contribute to their uh, recovery. So a lot of that is involved in the communication that we've talked about. The last piece that I think is really shows our connection with the customer, in this case in workers' compensation, is our return to work program. In there, we view the customer as not only the injured associate, but also our location leader and the coworkers. Because so many times we hear negative things about like duty return to work, that it either eats up payroll or productivity of the building, or other associates are having to take over additional tasks to make the accommodation for an injured associate. At Coles, we don't want any of those things to happen. And we also know that there's a benefit for the injured person to be able to come back and stay connected with Coles. Stay connected as an employee, not feel awkward about returning to work, um, and feel good about, no matter how strict their restrictions are, that we have something for them to do that they can contribute to the productivity of the, of the company. So what we have done in designing our program is first, we provided a payroll incentive for our leaders. And that really allows them to readily accept any and all temporary task. Um, it allows them to embrace that associate back as incremental payroll. Because I always say there's not a location manager out there that will not accept um, free labor, essentially. And that's what it is. So that helps, I think, in that conversation, that advocacy piece. At the same time, we tell the associate, and we know that the injured worker, um, their paychecks are important to them. And if they can have the opportunity to earn more money than they would recovering from home, then it's a benefit to them as well. So we bring our associates back at an increased rate of pay, but not 100% of their pay. This then also leaves an incentive for them to return to full duty. Um, further advancing, I think, their recovery times and so on. So all of these things, I think, help us to connect to the injured worker in a different way, um, in a way that advocates for them, that respects them when they're injured, and also helps them to remain connected to the organization as an employee, and hopefully speed recovery. As a result, um, over the last several years, we've seen over a 30% improvement in our overall costs, reductions in lost time, and one of the most important measures that, to me, is that our associates are telling us we're doing it right because our attorney representation has gone down by 37%. That's great. That's, that's so great. we're excited about that. That's and I bet you're, although not measured <coughs> probably, the presenteeism, the, the feeling amongst the workers has probably improved significantly. Well, wow. yes, absolutely. The, the return to work is successful. You're not just putting them out there and saying you've got to come back. Yeah, the stigmatism of it being a negative thing mm -hmm. around like duty has actually gone away in our organization. It seems as a positive. I love the focus on return to work because there is so much data out there around the fact that the longer a person is away from the workplace, the harder it is to ever get them back to work. So your focus on not only getting them back but getting them back in a productive role. And and really, you know, the things that you've done to make them welcome back, as opposed to, you know, if you, you view as a drain on the payroll, I think that's fantastic. The results yeah. speak for themselves. Those are great results. Great. Right. Thank you. Well, thank you both thank you. for being with us today. And for those watching, I think this is just really the tip of an iceberg of what we'll see, Mark, down the road with employers considering much more um, the importance of the experience of the employee and the associates throughout the claims process. Yeah, there's no doubt, Kimberly. I mean, I, my background, I think when I started in this industry, was working for a self-insured, self-administered employee, employer. And, you know, we were, we were told right off the bat, you do not use the word claims. These are not claims. These are your valued coworkers. These are your associates. These are your friends. And, and, you know, I think more and more we're going to see the industry evolving into that model where you focus on, just as you said earlier, doing what's right, doing the right thing. Makes a big difference. You know, there's one more point too I, I think that we should take away from this is as 
Julie was talking about the wellness discussion. There's much more focus on employee-centric health care. It's very difficult with health reform to silo out health for workers' compensation versus health day-to-day. -day. Well, this is a huge passion of yours, mm -hmm. the, the health care side and, and you know, the mental well-being and things. So I can keep waiting for you to jump in. Yeah, we need to hit that again down the road. All right, let's welcome in our final guest for today. All right, we have President of Safety National, Dwayne Hercules. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. And Dave North, President and CEO of Sedgwick. Thank you both. Thanks for joining us. All right, I think we're going to start with you, Dwayne. Um, we just heard from Julie and Kevin talk about how they're looking to evolve their claims handling model to a more customer-based focus. Um, there's also a lot of talk in the industry right now about moving away from provider networks and focusing on outcomes. And I think even Julie mentioned outcomes-based networks in, in her discussion. Yes. So um, what are your thoughts on this topic? Well, first I'd like to commend the, you know, the claims handlers, the risk managers, the carriers and the labor representatives for improving injured workers' lives, for improving workplace safety, while at the same time um, uh, having a focus on cost containment. You know, I think the current model's done a great job in improving workplace safety and improvements in cost containment. Um, we've seen it in uh, uh, almost all states, claims frequency is down. There are a few exceptions to that, but, so the efforts are working. But what we've also seen at the same time, the severity's gone up. And I think we don't need to scrap the one model. I think we need to continue with the efforts because we can see the, the positive outcomes we've already had. I think what we need to do is add another layer to those, and that is really to get more outcome-based uh, focus as an industry. I think we need to, uh, to move to an outcome-based uh, model, which really the healthcare industry is in the early stages of that already. Mm -hmm. But their focus is a little different than ours. You know, I think one of the big things is, first, you have to have buy-in from the executive level of all the stakeholders um, that uh, to have an outcome-based model may mean we're going to have to spend more money up front to get a better result down the road. You know, we may have to spend more money today, but in the end, it's going to reduce duration. It's going to reduce litigation. It's going to reduce reopenings, which in the end, lower costs. Um, so I think that's one area. Uh, another area I think is we have to get to the point where we can measure quality. And um, I think measuring the quality that the healthcare providers uh, give our patients, make sure that uh, we can measure our own efforts and what impact they're having and those things that really don't have positive impact on the outcome, we probably need to do away with those and uh, maybe move to something else, which is, you know, partly can be um, basically adopting, you know, medical technology. I think uh, the advancements in medical technology can have a significant impact on improving injured workers' lives, but that may be more expensive up front, things like prosthetics. You know, those have a, you know, can really change an injured, injured worker's lives, but the cost of that is pretty expensive up front. But in the long term, we wind up getting a, getting a better result. But, so I, I'm not advocating that we switch from one model to the other. I think it's, uh, you know, the continuous improvement. I think it's kind of the next evolution in the, in the claims model. Um, you know, the other thing is I think we need to always take the focus, and it was great to hear Kevin and Julie both talk about it with their employees. You know, you could tell it was heartfelt, but they really want their employees to feel valued. They want to get them back to work, and they're willing to, to do whatever it takes to uh, make, the, make that happen. And I think as, a, as an industry, we need to do more of that. And I always use my NFL analogy here, because it's kind of uh, a topical these days with, you know, the NFL just had a I don't know, a billion dollar plus settlement. And it's really because they had two standards of care. The superstar athletes, you know, the quarterbacks, you know, the highly paid guys, they got the best standard of care. They got the best specialists. They were kept out longer 
than the special teams players and the line. They were given lower standard of care. They were given, they were sent to doctors not as skilled as the superstar athletes. And what you wound up with is, you know, the superstar athletes, the quality of their life is, has been you know, very robust. And they've, they've, a lot of them have gone on had very successful second careers, broadcasters, you know, businessmen, etc. Those that received lower care were put back, you know, into the game too soon. Uh, you can see the outcome. You know, they, they're having early onset of dementia. They're dying at an earlier age. They're having a lot more problems. And now it's all come full circle back to the NFL because they were kind of penning, penning lies and pound foolish and not outcomes-based, more cost-based. And that's an extreme example. But I think we've done a good job so far with workplace safety, focusing on the injured worker, uh, containing costs. And I think the next, the next phase will be being more outcome-based. And, and, and when we talk about outcome-based, it may not, you know, we obviously we have to identify which claimants need that treatment. And that's, you know, part of the process. Instead of having one approach to all claimants, our process is going to have to evolve to identify the claimants by injury, by socioeconomic status, you know, a lot of different factors uh, and, and adjust our treatment protocols, our approach to these people uh, based on those, those factors. Let me jump in here, Dave. I want to ask you to follow up on something that Dwayne commented on, and that was his, his comments around the need to focus on quality providers, identifying the quality providers who give you the best medical option. I know this is an area that Seth has been putting a lot of effort into, identifying who are the doctors that give you the best results for the injured workers, getting away from that old model of focusing on discounts and you know, find the right doctors pay. Can you expand a little bit on what Seth was doing with that? Yeah, you know, I uh, just listening to the conversation for the last 40 minutes, it, it just struck me when you talk about that particular issue. In this entire conversation, whether it's insurers, risk managers, um, presidents of insurance companies, there's no dialogue about denying claims. Nobody's sitting in back rooms trying to figure out how to cut the delivery of service to injured workers in this country. We know, the professionals in the art industry know, if you deliver better care earlier on at the right time at the right place, the injured worker is treated better and the ultimate outcome is better to everybody. And sometimes I think the snippets that come out of the conversation as opposed to more fully developed conversations like this were misunderstood. We use terms like outcomes-based medicine and people interpret that that, well, they must be saying that well, the outcome equals cheaper, which isn't the case. Our industry adopted a model some time ago, as you said, where we selected doctors based on who was closest located to the planet and would agree to the biggest discounts. We've lived decades in that system, and we now universally know that's not the way to deliver health care. It got us doctors that you <coughs> wouldn't send your kids to. And medical costs kept going up. And medical costs kept going up. The modern way to do it is to find the best doctors and deliver the best treatment at the right time for the right injury. So whether it's a methodology that we use, where we use a five-star system, or whether somebody measures outcomes based on the delivery of quality of care, we have to step up and say, you know what? There are good doctors, bad doctors, and better doctors, and we need to find the best docs and get among the injured workers. And that's happening throughout the country right now. I think that's the message. This is not a something that we can look forward to in 2020. It's happening today throughout the country. Yeah, and that's something that I, I'm personally very excited about to see this this change in the focus of our industry away from that discounts and you know, penetration and into quality of care and outcomes. It's where we need to go. Absolutely, absolutely. So Dwayne, um, big data is something that is talked about, not just certainly within insurance and claims, but across business today. How important do you feel data and analytics are to the claims process? Well, claims models. Yeah, I, I feel like we're in the early stages of the data revolution. You know, we're just scratching the surface. And uh, I, you know, I, I feel it's you know, probably the highest priority for the industry in the work comp industry. I think just what Dave was talking about, when they look at providing the highest standard of care, measuring quality, 
it all starts with data. Knowing more about the injured employee, you know, I think all of that starts with data. And the more data we can get, the better we can do in analyzing it, and also uh, using it as predictive indicators. You know, there are no absolutes, but being able to identify those claimants that maybe need a higher standard of care or because of their injuries, we need to, you know, get them to the, the, the specialist, the best specialist that we can, get them the highest medical uh, care we can as soon as as soon as possible. So, uh, yeah, I think I think as a as an industry, we're playing a little bit of catch up on data compared to some other industries. But uh, I think we all acknowledge it, and I think everyone is making a concerted effort uh, in that area. Yeah, sounds like we, we have a lot of it. How we deploy it and use it to impact yeah, positively is is sort of somewhat still the question. You know, I, think, I think that is the key question because you know I couldn't agree with you more, Dwayne, about the, the quantity of data that we have, but we're we're also bumping up against I think a really important change that's happening in our industry where we we historically because we're a coverage centric. Um, entity, workers' compensation, right? It's defined by statute as a specific thing that happens to the human beings in our workforce. But the reality is, there's lots of things happening to the health of the human beings in our workforce. And where the technology is evolving so much, and healthcare, and, and actual technology, and available data, that our keeping our focus on this very narrow part is actually, I think, doing a disservice to the injured worker. That sending them to the best doctor that we can find and not being able to share their entire medical profile. Everything that's happening to that human being is potentially actually having adverse treatment that's occurring and not getting them with back. Unfortunately, and, and I have to qualify this statement because I, I don't want to um, sound like that I'm um, opposed to confidentiality, but unfortunately the way the, our confidentiality laws are going in this country, both medical record confidentiality, personal identifiable uh, information, which we all have the right to have protected, right? Not used in a way that's adverse to any of us as individuals. But the reality is, your work comp injury is impacted by your diabetes, by your smoking, by your treatment plan that's occurring in some other part. And we're up against a body of law that's not allowing us to enable the professionals that we are hiring to treat those employees as a whole. And I think that's an area that our industry has got to take up soon and help the politicians understand they have to do the difficult task of protecting the rights of individuals' information, but allowing those individuals to authorize the use of that information for programs that they see as beneficial to them. Yeah, I think Dave makes a good point. Not knowing the comorbidities, you know, trying to get somebody the highest quality of care when you only know maybe 50% of the story or less. And what you're doing may actually impact some other issues they have and exacerbate the situation um, where you're trying to help but you don't have the information. So. Dave, we talk about how the workers' compensation industry has been evolving and changing. And one thing that strikes me that's been really slow to evolve is that you know, for, for years now, we've had this model where you focus on, you know, what's the adjuster's caseload, the adjuster, if you performed all these tasks. But claims over the years have gotten so much more complicated. Workers' compensation today isn't what it was when I started handling claims 25 years ago. 25? <laughs> <laughs> Your show, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, you know, how do you, how do you see uh, that the industry really needs to evolve this claims handling model? How do we need to move forward and, and to do a better job of providing the right care, the right treatment to injured workers, and processing the claims better? Yeah, and uh, it's a great topic. And I think um, there are so many different aspects of that because whether you come at it with the ever-changing way we're delivering health care, uh, whether you come at it from the way that technology is enabling us to do better, the incredible new skill sets of human beings that we're attracting into this industry, it just amazes me to walk into claims offices today and look at 
recently graduated college graduates that are sitting in the desk that are tackling problems that when that phone rings, they actually believe they are helping human beings' lives get better. And it happens to be a work comp issue. Uh, so, but we have to let the model evolve. We're, you know, some of us that have been around 25 or more years, <laughs> we, we still stick to some of our own guns. We have three-point contact. It's my most favorite banner to wave. Three-point contact has got to be the most archaic standard that we all shove into uh, selection contracts and RFPs yeah. and all answer. And if anybody just sets down for one moment and thinks about it, if you want me to make a three-point contact to the employee and the supervisor and the doctor in 24 hours, you find me the doctor that will talk to me in the first 24 hours after the treatment. It is a guaranteed non-compliance. And in fact, they probably don't want me to talk to them then because they haven't really gone through the whole process. So we've got to start letting the, the way we measure be understood by what we're measuring and why we're measuring. There's some things early on in the claim that we're not measuring well enough that we should focus on more, and there's some of the stuff that we're focusing on early that we really just don't need to get to until later on. The technology has enabled us to do it completely different. We have to let that happen. Well, and as you point out, so many of these triggers and these measures that have been built into claim contracts for years, we're really focused on the process, not really the actual handling of the claim. To me, that, that's where I see that evolution need to take place. It's not check the box if you make this contact within 24 hours. It's did we make the right decisions? Did we do the right things? Did we get the right information at the right time? Technology is enabling that completely different because we're connected now, whether it's through mobile technology, within workers, electronic communications with supervisors and plants, electronic communications with treating physicians' offices, all of the kinds of things that are out there today, we have to let that technology start to enable us to change the process. We recently did an exhaustive look at the entire work complex process. We had people from the desks looking at it, not people like me that read the textbook and, and know what it's supposed to be. We were actually in the trenches. And we said, break this claim process apart. Identify those things, individual tasks that actually add value, and those things that are done for other reasons compliance or I don't know why, but we've always done with stuff. And somewhere in the scary range of 35 to 40 percent of the things that we do on a work comp claim today, those professionals could not identify a value. Now, maybe to the reporting bureaus, NCCI, or maybe to a compliance with some statute that's been passed to, to be able to report on a forum, it's necessary, but an actual deliver, delivery of the claim for that injured worker, the value connection isn't there. And we have to start challenging that stuff and say, hey, we're wasting a lot of time and energy on those things, and it's not making that injured worker get well, faster, and back to work. Yeah, Kevin mentioned that earlier, the big stack of paperwork that you have to file in the state of California. And none of that you know, aids in the benefit delivery process. None of that is focused on getting that person back to work, being in the right treatment. It's this, this churn, this bureaucracy that just seems to detract from what should be the ultimate goal here. And it does sound like that as technology enables the claims maybe to take care of some of the data on their own instead of having examiners do that, that we could also then look at the role of the claims examiner to be able to help people more and help the process more instead of requiring so much of the manual input and like you said that 30 to 40 percent that if our if our claims examiners can't identify the benefit i have no doubt that uh, you've got a team looking at so how does someone else take care of that or the system yeah and some of it we don't have to look very far um, we think we talked about where our industry is the work comp industry compared to some other areas in the disability arena or in the group health arena when you make your first contact with that organization to talk about your injury or your disability or your absence, that individual on the other end of the phone has an enormous amount of wealth of information to explain the process to you, to give you answers, to coach you through the process. In work comp, we have intake. Call me, answer these 82 questions so I can figure out the state first report form. Thank you very much. You can contact by your examiner in a short period of time. No wonder the worker is wondering what's going to happen next. We didn't tell them about it, and it's probably their first claim. So the more progressive models today 
have a customer-centric model up front where it's not even the claims professional that's touching that claim yet, but as an individual understands workers' compensation, understands the state statute, understands the employer's model, you just heard about two very complex models, understand those models, communicate with that employee and say, you know what, it's going to be okay. We are here to help you with it. Well, and at the end of the day, get back to communication. How important is communication in this entire process? It's, it's, it's communicating with the injured workers, it's communicating with the, the medical professionals, it's that need for communication throughout the entire process and how it's going to just make it flow better. And, and just as that's happening, we're facing a lot of headwinds with that. The changing demographics in the United States is rapid. So we've got age demographic differences of whether somebody wants a text or an email or a telephone call. We've got um, changes in demographics in terms of ethnic backgrounds, all kinds of things that I think is going to keep us all occupied well into the future to get that one. Very true, very well, Mark, if there's one thing I think that we and our guests have heard today, it's around this, and Dave, you just said it, this customer-centric model, an employee-centric model, and certainly the partnership that we need to create and forge ahead with injured workers, with the medical community, and certainly with our colleagues, as we know that bringing others into the industry is increasingly important. Uh, many of us have been in the industry 25-plus years, and we've got to create... <laughs> A plus years and uh, we really need to create an environment that is enticing to you know the the A and B's of the world to want to come in and work with us so um, just to recap on the employee centric advocacy and well-being certainly we heard from that with um, Kevin and Julie increasing partnerships which really I think comes back to the communication and quality care definitely is is def a shift um, but tied more to the claims model in the future so that hopefully um, it's just known that when you're injured on the job, you'll have the best provider possible. That's true. I agree, I agree. As we wrap up today, I wanted to take a moment to mention Kids Chance of America. Uh, Safety National and Cedric are both very proud to be uh, corporate sponsors of Kids Chance of America. They really are both on their board of directors. And this is, this is a great charitable organization that focuses on giving back. It's, it ties so well into the workers' compensation industry. This organization helps provide college scholarships for the children of workers who were killed or permanently uh, disabled in a, in a work injury. If you were at RIMS, I encourage you to stop by the Kids Chance booth, which is uh, booth 1462 in the Expo Hall. Can't really I'll be at that booth. Uh, what would you say? Monday, 4 to 5, Mark. We'll be there, stop by and say hello, and we'll be glad to tell you all about Kids Chance and how you can get involved. I wanted to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. I think this was a great conversation. Thanks to Cedric and Safety National for sponsoring us. Thanks for the lady on the wall for not uh, stabbing me in the back. And uh, go out and make it a great day. Keep following us on Outfront Ideas at Twitter, Outfront Ideas, and visit our website, outfrontideas.com for information on our future webcasts and also all of our archive past webcasts. And enjoy NOLEP and RIMS 2015. Thanks, Thanks much. Sir.